as the week began to develop and I was looking at the things I do, God just really dropped in my heart to share with you this segment of Tree of Life Realities. This is part seven, the purpose of this life. Um, it's condensed a little bit, but I think it still can be understood and embraced. Uh, as you know, at the end of the month, next month, next year, <laughs> uh, we're going to do it over a three-day period, similar like we do Genesis Factor Light. It's a bit different. takes concepts we spoke about in Genesis Factor to the next place. challenges us. That's one of the things I want to do today. I felt like, you know, I, I wasn't really thinking about do I have a word of the Lord for 2018. Then I began to realize, you know, sometimes you don't need some special word that rhymes with the number eight. No. You know, <laughs> something like, you know, yeah, who knows. Um, but instead, sometimes maybe God would say something to really pull us to another place. So I'm going to ask you to listen with new ears today. I'm going to ask you to consider, especially if you've never been through Genesis Factor, some very different ideas. But I think you may find, if you search your spirit, that these ideas are probably more true than some of the things you've believed. Because in the end, belief... And the way we use it in the last century or two is not the way the Bible used the word belief. We've all have come to a place, I think, in life where we, uh, even as Christian people at times, we've asked ourselves the questions, why am I here? What's my purpose in life? You know, there's this uh, wonderful statement by Morpheus and Matrix, the 1999 first film, which we're actually going to see a clip of in a little while. He's let me tell you why you are here. You're here because you know something. What you know, you can't explain, but you feel it. You felt it your entire life, that there's something wrong with the world. You don't know what it is, but it's here, there, like a splinter in your mind. I think that's absolutely a beautiful way <laughs> of putting it because all the religious systems, political systems, everything that exists, because it's because there's something gnawing at the inside of us. Religions didn't just happen. They happened because of something on the inside of us that we knew. The Hebrew phrase, really, for something that you knew, but you can't put your finger on what it is, is called reshimon, the spiritual memory. You see, we all were once this massive creature called Adam, made up of masculine and feminine spiritual qualities. We all were in the garden. Adam wasn't a guy that lived 6,000 years ago. We are Adam. That's why Jesus, when it talks about putting the body back together, the last Adam, he's putting us back together. But the thing is, we all have this crazy sensation, this memory on the inside of ourself of a place far better than this wasn't because we just want to believe because this life sucks. It's because we know all over the planet. I love the statement in the movie Contact by the Matthew McConaughey character, which is based on, uh, um, what's his name? I just went blank. Carl Sagan. Carl Sagan's book of the same, although the characters are broken up. They kind of combine the characters a little bit in that book. Um, he says, when she says, there's no such thing as God, Matthew McConaughey says, can you say then throughout all of history that 95% of humanity is wrong? 
See, there's something gnawing on the inside of us. The rushing moment, the memory is kind of like a glass of milk. If you fill that glass of milk and you pour it out, there's that residue of the milk. So we all have a residue of the place called the Garden of Eden. And we're all looking for that. We're all sensing it. But we can't exactly put our, our brains to it because our brains can't comprehend this. So we do things like ask those questions. Why am I here? Why do I exist? What is the meaning of life? What is my purpose here? The very reason why we ask is because we already have a sense of the answer. The real issue is, are we really serious about the questions? Because to be serious about the question means I have to be really serious about the answer. These questions are, are born not out of that sense of reason or logic. They're born out of a memory. A deep-rooted memory of something seemingly too intangible to formalize, and yet even the attempt to formalize causes a remembrance that becomes more overwhelming because of what we may find. For many of us, answering the unanswered question begins with a quest, yet sadly ends with either finding relief in the two major human disciplines, science or religion. And both are quite similar, because both have to start with a hypothesis. As I started to say before, in the 1999 movie The Matrix, written and directed by the Warshawski siblings, has one of the best theological sequence regarding these questions, in my opinion, 26 minutes into the film. I had a laugh, it was 26 minutes, because the Yahweh, the yod heh vav -Heh, equaled the number 26. Keanu Reeves performing the part of Thomas Anderson, uh, by the way, Thomas as in Doubting Thomas is the suggestion there, has come to terms that there is something more to life than just the existence he has. In his pursuit to answer these gnawing questions, through a series of circumstances, his path leads to a person known as Trinity, who then begins, or um, excuse me, be, brings him to another character known as Morpheus, by, placed by Lawrence Fishburne. Um, Morpheus, for those of you who may not know, Morpheus is a Greek god, and he's the Greek god of dreams. The word itself is a verb, which means to make or change form. In the famous letter of the book of Galatians, the fourth chapter and the 19th verse, the apostle Paul employs that word when he pens, my little children of whom I travail in birth again till Christ be Morpheus, formed in you. It's at this, this point, Morpheus speaks with Thomas, calling him now by his transformational name, which is Neo. Neo, which means new, new as in the sense of young and fresh, but can also imply unlearned. Paul also implies that word by the, employs that word, by the way, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 10, and have put on the Neo-man the new man, which was renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. It's in this meaning Neo and Mr. or Mr. Anderson not only is confronted with the answers, uh, excuse me, is not only confronted with the awareness of the question, but more so a more periling thing, which is a choice to know the answer. The dialogue, I'm going to skip over some, but we will see the whole thing in a minute. Morpheus says this, let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you know something. What you know you can't explain, but you feel it. You felt it your entire life. 
that there's something wrong with the world. You don't know what it is, but it's there, like a splinter in your mind driving you mad. It is this feeling that has brought you to me. Do you know what I'm talking about? Neo responds, the Matrix. Morpheus, do you know what it is? There's more important dialogue, but then he says this. Unfortunately, no one can be told what the Matrix is. You have to see it for yourself. I thought that was uh, that last part is very interesting because after we see the clip in a minute, I'm going to come back and want to go through the dialogue in a biblical context and talk to you about our matrix. You know, one of the things that's interesting is that from a religious view, many would erroneously point to secularism as the matrix, or more commonly, the world. The world is the secular world. There's actually no such thing as a secular world. We find such claims throughout Christian, both modern and postmodern Christian writings, claiming that humanism or any of its components or spin-offs like narcissism, hedonism, materialism, pluralism, atheism, naturalism, evolution, and ethical relativism, relativism, just to mention a few, is what's wrong with the world. It would add other labels to the secular sphere. For those who were once intended the church and left it, they're called nominals, and so on. I literally spent hours on the internet viewing Christian media productions, some quite famous, to find a statement that would summarize the view of the world or the matrix. Sadly, few to none would state the obvious. It would be dressed with choruses of spiritual terms and selected Bible verses. As one article put it regarding the secular world, quote, Surrendering to the enemy, we have stooped to digging our own graves. Consequently, we believe it critical for both the church and society that the church of Jesus Christ respond to the God-given imperative, let your light so shine. But realizing some may misunderstand this thesis, we want to make it clear that we're not advocating the social gospel, which still overshadows the majority of the church. Here's another one. As motion picture after motion picture is actively pursued, the real picture of what's going on in the world becomes less and less clear to those who are willfully ignorant, to which there is no excuse. Truly ignorant of the fails of society and even more so ignorant to the reality of God. The same could be said true of those who use their phones all day long, engaging in meaningless likes and back and forth with simple text messages as the vast social media sites tweet and gather the latest gossip from their pagan idols who wholeheartedly are examples of the damned. Harsh words? I think not. The harshest words are reserved for those who do these things those whose hearts are not right before their creator, who have become a Christian, yet their mouth, with their mouth they confess Jesus Christ in word only. They stand before the creator and hear, the, hear his words, depart from me. Matthew seven twenty three. he quotes. Their mouths to be shut, their eternal destination sealed, their hopes dashed, and their hearts dismayed. There was other quotes, but I'm going to skip over them. When we do Tree of Life Reality class, I may include that one because that could even be more unsettling. So let me undress the obvious from its platitudes and state the bottom line. To the religious mind, the matrix or the world are those who don't believe in God or believe in a God not embraced by their specific dogma and thus live a life of moral relevancy accordingly. I circled Christianity as one of the lists of religions because Christianity is a religion. It doesn't mean anything as far as relationship with God goes if you don't have one. <laughs> the problem is a lot of us have a relationship with something, but it's not always the Christian God. It's more the anti-Christian God. No, I put that very nicely.
These statements, including my attempted summation by biblical or God's or Christ's definition, are not the world or the matrix. In point, they're only part of the world's definition according to Christ. Actually, you would have to include most all of the articles I read, including the three mentioned, well, two I mentioned, I skipped over one, as part of the secular world system. Thank you. At best, such is ignorance, or one can accuse or argue that such is deluded or willfully ignorant, as we just read, according to Jesus, that would, on, that, that would apply only to those who say they see God spiritually and blindly tout such things, John 9, 39 through 41. In true spirituality, in true spirituality there's no such thing as being deluded or deliberately ob oblivious. It's an impossibility. If anything, it's just one atheistic or agnostic ego clashing with one's religious ego to make such claims. According to Jesus and the apostles, both are secular, meaning both are living in the worldly system. You cannot be deluded about what you don't see. Again, at best you can be ignorant and thus do and say things out of that ignorance, even hurtful things. However, they're the same. The accusation and the ignorant are the same. The difference between religion and secularism by religious terms ultimately, really, from a spiritual point of view, is the difference between heroin and methadone. Both are opioids, both blind the same places in the brain. Just imagine a person, no a leader, on methadone condemning a heroin addict. It would be absurd, but we do it all the time. The very fact that we accuse is a symbol of our own religiosity. Well, I'm not accusing, I'm just stating a fact. Dress it any way you like. The difference is one doesn't steal or do worse to get his fix. Rather, he goes to an appropriate clinic to get his needs met. But the base reason for addiction, both the physiological and psychological dependency, hasn't changed. We just found a more acceptable way to deal with our addiction. Religion has its same roots as secularism. To use those traditional terms of Christian, Christian, Christendom, to make a, a delineation for a minute, ju just one appears more acceptable to the other, depending upon who you speak to. Keep in mind, either believes they're right, so the discussion isn't going to go much, go far with any true insight. Ephesians 2.2 2 in the Latin is where the word secular appears. It's in the phrase, the course of this world. The course of this secular, this world system. But well, it's interesting, within the context, he's speaking of the religious. So why are you here? What is your purpose in life? Who are you? Is there more to life than just this existence? The fact that we even reluctantly ask points us into the direction of an answer. The challenge is, do you really want to know? Are you really willing to shed your secularism, including your Christian religion, and find the Christ? Challenging words on live stream. Let's listen to Morpheus. Let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you know something. What you know you can't explain, but you feel it. You felt it your entire life. 
that there's something wrong with the world. You don't know what it is, but it's there, like a splinter in your mind, driving you mad. It is this feeling that has brought you to me. Do you know what I'm talking about? The Matrix. Do you want to know what it is? The Matrix is everywhere. It is all around us. Even now, in this very room. You can see it when you look out your window or when you turn on your television. You can feel it when you go to work, when you go to church, when you pay your taxes. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. What truth? That you are a slave, Neo. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage, born into a prison that you cannot smell or taste or touch. A prison for your mind. <sighs> Unfortunately, no one can be told what the Matrix is. You have to see it for yourself. This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Remember, all I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. I'm going to change the word matrix and put it, use a biblical word instead. Let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you know something. What you know you can't explain, but you feel it. You felt it your entire life. There's something wrong with the world. You don't know what it is, but it's there, like a splinter in your mind driving you mad. It's this feeling that's brought you to me. Do you know what I'm talking about? You may respond. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Do you want to know what it is? You may nod your head. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is everywhere. It's all around you. It's all around us. Even now in this very room, you can see it when you look out your window, when you turn on your television. You can feel it when you go to work, when you go to church, when you pay your taxes. It's the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. Before I continue, let me remind you of something from the Genesis Factor class. The word tree, eitz in Hebrew, means to close the eyes. And it's the idea that you can't Behold the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life at the same time. You either close your eyes to one and open it to the other, or you close your eyes to this tree and open it to the other. You can't live in both worlds. So we have to choose. As we say in Genesis Factor, many times we get a glimpse of the tree of life. We call that coming to Christ. And then we immediately shut our eyes and try to live the Christ life, biblical life, on the basis of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the system that we're in. Kind of like a fish that's breathing water. The water is the knowledge of, the good, of good and evil, and we're constantly inhaling it as our breath, rather than actually taking a breath from another world. So you may ask, what truth? 
similar to what Pilate asked. The Holy Spirit may respond that you are a slave, insert your name. Like everyone else, you're born into bondage, born into a prison you can't smell, taste, or touch, a prison for your mind. Unfortunately, no one can be told what the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is. You have to see it for yourself. Then opening the pill box of choice. This is your last chance. After this, there's no turning back. You take the blue pill, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the secular dream world, which, which includes its variants of religion, including the Christian religion. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill, the tree of life, what Jesus Christ came to reveal to us and point the way to the source of all creation, the Father, and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Remember, all I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. In John 9.39, the scripture says, for judgment I've come into this world, that those who do not see may see, that those who see might be made blind. If you really think about that, that's a challenging statement to us, because most of us judge the blind as not seeing. Jesus says the reverse. I look for translations of this, but I found them all m missing an element. The word judgment really isn't a fair word here. It's also in some of our Bibles translated condemned. For condemnation I've come into this world. We know that's not right. Literally, the Greek word there means for a definitive decision. For a definitive decision I've come into this system, cosmos, the world in order that those who don't see might see, and those who do see or say they see will be blind. You see, we're, we are all, if you will, in a matrix. We are in the system of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. This is not a play that we can walk away from in the movie theater and then go back to our life. You're living in the system. Religion, including the Christian religion, lives in that system because it's got all its rights and wrongs, it's moral this and moral that, it's got all those things. And you can even read the Bible through the eyes of that tree and blindly call yourself righteous before God. It's all around us, we breathe it. We go to work in it, we go to church in it, we see through its lens, we predominantly read our Bible through its filter. We, like the demoniac of the Gadarenes, who had the, both the demons and the legion, even worship in its system, according to Mark 5, 6. However, this is not about a teaching a doctrine, a religious or political view or embracing another way of thinking. This is about seeing this world with eyes never used before. It's not just about changing a point of view. It's about a view never seen. Yet a reality that always was. Many times people have said to me regarding this, I understand what you're saying, and repeat back to me what they heard. But potentially that's the problem and the difference between religion and revelation. Religion is hearing and repeating. Revelation is seeing and hearing, which you couldn't before that. It could not be perceived or heard it's using eyes that we never used for the first time. In contrast between the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life 
is understanding who the opponent is. Maybe this will help you on how the system works. Who is the real Satan or devil in the system or the cosmos or the world or the matrix? Who is the real devil in the air that you breathe? The environment in which you live? One way to point it out is through the function of who we commonly call Satan or the real opponent is by these examples. Something seriously negative has just happened in your life. A challenging sickness, a financial problem, a marital issue, a family problem, and so on and so on we go. The religious mind says, that's the devil. He attacked me with sickness, or that situation, or challenge, or that person. We've all been tempted to think in those terms. In some cases, even thought that was the case. Yet for the moment, before we talk about spiritual reality, let's expose the true Satan or adversary in the system. In most cases, the only difference between the religious and what they define as secular is that a secular person may say, that person, that political system, those people, they are the problem. The religious mind simply dilutes this into saying that person, that political system, those people are being used by the devil. Pick your poison. Heroin or methadone. In the end, they both kill. And as far as Jesus Christ is concerned and true spirituality, both are the same. The spiritual Christ-like perception, the one who sees spiritual reality, reality as it truly is, has a different view of the system and reality. It understands that the object, the sickness, the financial struggle, the person, the politics, and so on, are not the obstacle or Satan. Or even being used of the devil. Actually, it's our reaction that's the true enemy. Actually, it's our reaction that's the true enemy. It's our reaction that is the true Satan. It's in that moment and only there in that kairos we define whether we live in the matrix or the tree of knowledge of good and evil or the tree of life. Let's be clear, we're not excusing violence, abuse, prejudice, or any other attribute of the tree of knowledge of good and evil against creation as now it's okay. But you can't change another's view of, of others or the world or the system or God until you've truly made the transition from death, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, to life. If we truly don't make the transition, we will then bring down Christ inappropriately from above, as the Apostle Paul warns us in Romans 10, 6 through 7. By our legalistic accusations, by pointing to the violence, abuse, the prejudice, or any other egoistic manifestation of evil, and elevating our egoistic sense of rightness, that same satanic self-righteousness, that same satanic self-centeredness, egoistic delusion of spirituality, which is nothing more than another branch of the same tree we condemn. In the end, we simply transform the resurrected Christ into an actual antichrist and are clueless that we've done so. Let's quickly unpack that. Remember, we were designed to receive pleasure. We, as a collective creature called Adam, once lived in the Garden of Eden, which means Garden of Pleasure. What this life is about is how we will draw pleasure. Did you hear me? Listen. What this life is about is how you will choose to draw pleasure. Will it be 
Instant gratification which explodes like a big bang and gratifies our desires in an instant. For example, shouting at the guy who cut you off on the freeway. You are receiving pleasure from your accusation. I say you, you understand? Uh, I've been the guy too, so. <laughs> How about taking advantage of a company's oversight or demise and calling it your as gain just business? Condemning an adversary before proven guilty and calling it justice. Being zealously right in an argument with your spouse for the sake of winning it, even if it's at the expense of their well-being. Or will you draw pleasure from the Father, the source of all creation, which is not always instant, but permanent? It may be recognizing that the guy who cut you off was indulging in his own instant gratification. That's why I cut you off. And rather than us draw from the same source as he or she is drawing, let's draw from a higher source and forgive them. Recognizing we felt the same way and praying for them to have a higher revelation of life. How about rather than the opportunity to advance in business by squashing another or taking advantage of their mishap, maybe, maybe it would be not just about you prospering, but all of the employees of even that company who may have lost their jobs. Rather, you may find yourself merging companies. Not only will it bless you, but it's going to bless them too. Or redefining companies. Now, sometimes there are things, you know, we do need to let go. But it's all where you're drawing your pleasure from. What pleases you? Does it feel good? Are we taking that explosion of light and misusing it? That explosion of the, the, the presence of God and misusing it? You see, because when we're angry and pointing our finger at the guy at the freeway, we're misusing the presence of God at that point. How about rather than being right in the argument with your spouse that you want to bring divine life to the situation, which may even mean you not winning, but loving them to a new level of life. When we accuse the object, we are nothing more than another religion and exactly like it. Pointing the finger and in so doing, drawing pleasure from our, for ourselves from the tree of knowledge of good and evil or the serpent himself. Notice the difference in, the com in uh, comparison to how Jesus dealt with Peter and Judas. To Peter... In Matthew 16, 22 through 20, 23, it says this. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, now this is after Jesus talks about going to the cross kind of thing, dying being, and suffering. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. You're an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. See, this system of man is also the system of Satan. They're one and the same. Then, interestingly enough, in John 13, 26 through verse 27, Jesus, having dipped the bread, gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, and now after the piece of bread, Satan entered him. And Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. Wait, what? Isn't there an interesting dynamic there? Peter, Jesus confronts, and the guy who's about to betray him 
to the Romans and be crucified, he says, do quickly. Rather, you would think, because this is the way we behave, we point our fingers to the Judas and say, you devil. See, it's all about the intention of the reaction. And neither of them occurred because he was right. Jesus' response was never about being right. I guess if we were going to really be spiritual about it, I saw this picture I'm going to show you. I thought, it's funny, but if you're really playing the game right, this is how it happens. When Chuck Norris plays chess, the opponent king kills himself. Jesus responded in both cases in ways when you look at it from a tree of knowledge of good and evil sense, they make no sense. Why chide Peter, who was, who was simply innocently loving his Savior, oh, I don't want this to happen to you, and seemingly condone Judas? Well, one may say, Jesus knew God's bigger picture. Okay, hold that thought. You're getting the idea. Jesus challenged Peter not because Peter was the spawn of some sludge of evil, but because Peter, the eventual, eventual bishop of Rome, wasn't seeing the bigger picture. Peter wasn't responding from a divine love, but from a carnal, fleshly desire called love. You know, even things that you think you love many times is just to gratify your desire. There are many people in love with the idea of being in love until they get into the relationship and all of a sudden they got problems. Because what I wanted, they can't give. And it's actually unfair for me to ask them to give it to me. For that space. I'm not talking about all the other relationship things that you work through. I'm talking about that inner spiritual pleasure. May I suggest to you, many of us interpret love from that tree of knowledge of good and evil point of view. I'm saying this because I love you. Please don't, especially if you have to specify. On the other hand, when it came to Judas, rather than get contrary to him, Jesus allowed things to take its course for the divine purpose of redemption, or you can say divine love. If Jesus would have gotten contrary with Judas, a per, the per personification of Satan in his intention, it wouldn't have empowered anyone. Actually, Jesus would have put himself at the same level as Judas. Jesus did nothing from an intention of instant emotional, intellectual, moral, or immoral gratification. Jesus always saw the bigger picture and never responded from an egoistic idea. You know, one of the things, I, mean, I was listening to a news program earlier this year, this, this year, well, yeah, technically this year, I can't go much later. <laughs> earlier this week, and the announcer was saying to the pastor, because of the things the pastor was saying, basically, you are the holder of the moral standard. And I thought to myself, both are deceived. The pastor's supposed to proclaim morality? Really? When you think about this, what we don't realize is that actual that religious intention, that secularism coming shrouded and clothed in its religious garb. Why? How come? Are you saying certain things are okay or not okay? My point is, is living from another world. And if you go to when we get to class eight in Tree of Life, you'll see what I'm talking about, but I'm not going to talk about that today. 
But one of the key things of this is understanding many of us live good moral lives because it makes us feel good because they don't. So we can say, we, never, we would never face ourselves in the mirror and say this, I like feeling like I'm okay and they're not. I'm just worried about them. We are here, not simply because of some Adamic fall that caused a catastrophic diversion in God's plan for creation. And as some last-ditch effort, the Father sent the Son almost wringing his hands with the hope that we would believe on him and would consequently salvage some mess, this hideous mess that we've made. Jesus didn't come here to save the mess. And especially try to save it before it all burns up. Actually, his intention from the beginning of creation was to create a creature that would be his image and likeness in every respect of his representation. Can you agree with that? His intention from the beginning of creation was, by the way, if you're watching live stream, somebody said, can you just say that again? His intention from the beginning of creation was a creature that would be his image and likeness in every true aspect of his representation. To, that, to do that, the creator had to give the creature the capacity to love. Because the creator is love. To give the creature the capacity to genuinely love, it had to have a choice to not to. It had to have the right to refuse, to go another path. So that creature, that living soul called the Adam, with both masculine and feminine qualities, were given a choice between divine life and the egoistic tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It would this, be this necessary ingredient that would give his creature the ability to be equivalent in form, which is love. You see, that choice had to be real. It couldn't be a facade with no true consequence. It had to be real. If not, we would have been nothing more than a robot or more accurately, God's glorified pet. When we think of the choice between the two trees, in a particular tree of the knowledge of good and evil, as giving us a genuine consequence, we have to realize that is the case, which is the truth. But it was also a consequence for God, the creator. He had to give us the right to not choose him. But God wasn't interested in pets or robots. He was interested in a creature equivalent to his form, his image, his likeness. Nevertheless, the creator is not egoistic, not self-centered, not self-absorbed. The source of all, the father, the upwelling of all life is love, light, and life personified. He offered a genuine choice, not only in the garden, but also a choice even if we chose to the contrary. He never stopped offering choice because that was the key to be like God or equal in form. One can say that sadly, we all chose the egoistic illusion of the tree of knowledge of good and evil and fell from paradise. But you see, that didn't stop the creator, the source of all things. Because he wasn't done with his creation. we got to get rid of this pagan fatalism. The consequence now became the necessar necessary component. I'll say it again. The consequence became the necessary component. Like I said to you a couple of weeks ago, if you're walking with, with Jesus from 1st Street to 3rd Street, and you got to pass... Orange Avenue to get to 3rd Street, Street and Maple. 
and you veer left and go down orange. The religious mind says, oh my gosh, he's disobeyed God. <coughs> and we're going to go down orange now, and Jesus is going to be waiting on the corner of orange and second. <laughs> and because he goes all the way, we start going, then we realize, where's Jesus? How did I miss God? Oh, Lord. Did I do something wrong? I must have. Now i got to find my way back to Jesus. And I don't know where I'm going. I don't know how I got here. That's the point. No, when you turned left on Orange and Second, Jesus went with you. With no condemnation. Because that turn now became part of your necessary consequence. It became part of, it's just the way you chose to learn. That's all. Hear those words. It's the way you chose to learn. Because everything is about you having the right to choose so you can be like God. Because without choice, love isn't love. See, when I fall quote, in love with somebody because they make me feel good, I may have missed the point. It's so simple, it's almost stupid. But you'd be surprised how the illusion that we breathe, the matrix of the knowledge of good and evil that we live in, so easily moves us. We don't even realize we're there most of the time. The consequence now became the necessary component and he offered still another choice. A choice to return to our rightful state which would put us in a better status than we started. Now hear this. In the garden we were both ignorant and innocent of what it meant to be his image. The innocence meant we weren't intentionally selfish or self-serving. The ignorance meant we knew nothing else. I didn't know what it was. And couldn't truly love, because love must be born of choice. So God gave a choice between two trees, to choose, tree, tree, to choose the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, or tr choose the tree of life. But to be honest with you, God wasn't exactly worried or despondent about our choice. Oh my gosh, they chose the wrong tree. <laughs> no, rather, in what could appear to be the worst of situations, God's point of view was, I got them right where I want them. That's what it says. Go back and read the un unpreached verse of Genesis 3. That once they partook of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, he says, behold, they have become like one of us. Isn't that the end game? What? See, God lived in the realm of choice. That's why he loves. He knows when he says he loves you, he's choosing it. Most of us don't choose God. We're more scared of hell. That's coercion, and there's no spiritual coercion in true spirituality. You can't coerce somebody into truth. You can get them to join your Christian club, but you can't in true spirituality. You, they have to come to a place of enlightenment. That you can pray for, but see, the, many times the only way people are enlightened is by the measure of your own enlightenment. And I find it interesting while many of us would argue that the whole world is going to hell in a handbasket, maybe it's because we haven't revealed much. Ouch. Jesus was clear. First, he said that you, if you would be one, the world would believe. We haven't figured out what one means. We think being one is 60,000 people go going into a, a stadium and, and singing worship songs. Well, yeah, good try, right? Yeah. 
But what was the point? I'm not saying some people, quote, didn't get saved and join your club because their life was miserable. How many folks got saved because their life was miserable? I've been pastoring over 30 years, now traveling the world. I can promise you this. A lot of people came to Christ because life was miserable or they were afraid of hell. And then after they came to Christ, life was miserable and they're still afraid of hell. (laughs) I'll talk to you about transformation in just a moment as we begin to wrap this up. God's point of view was I cut them right where I want them. Through the fall, we all became knowing, knowing what egoism and the illusion of separation feels like. In the darkness of the death sleep, which is existing in this physical world without knowing our true identity and dreaming of our delusions of grandeur, we're still given a choice, a choice to awake to who we really are. Through Christ, we are offered the choice to retain our knowing, but not about good and evil, but about who we are and who we're not. It's in that knowing we discover another kind of choice. Hear me. To regain our innocence without being ignorant. We can both be knowing and innocent at the same time, giving us choice in the highest form to be like God, the creator, and choose love, life, and light, which are all descriptions of the divine pleasure of the garden and divine oneness. So we now live in the garden, or as the Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians 2.6, we're seated in heavenly places in Christ right now, Not because we knew nothing else. Like before the fall. But because we are knowing. And choose to live there. Not because it's our right. Some of this, I'm a king's kid. Stop. Still coming from that egoistic place of pleasure. Hear me. Not because it's our right but because it's our love and our beloved is there. So what's our purpose in this life? To choose. Not only the one time and it's over, claiming I now have fire insurance and got my heavenly flight ticket (laughs) when I die, which all really missed the point. It's time to let go of such religious, lowly ideas and attain the purpose of our creation. It begins by realizing Jesus is an example of us and not just for us. It's the realization that the things that happen in our lives are not the true enemy, the serpent or Satan, regardless of how terrible terrible it may be. Hear me out here. but rather they are a shadow of the two trees appearing in stages in our lives. Choose how you will react. Will you be Satan and draw from instant gratification with whatever empowers your sense of self? Or will you be Christ and draw from a higher pleasure that leads to the revelation of God? The object is not your enemy. Your reaction is your enemy. I'm not saying sickness is fun, let's all go do it. Although we're all going to be faced with it in some shape, way, or form. But in that moment, we have two trees before us. How am I going to respond? You see, because if I come against a sickness, nine times out of ten, it's going to come back at us like a boomerang. It'll put you right back in that situation. But, and it's not, you understand, I'm saying sickness because that's the obvious one. I don't know about you. I get a head cold and I start complaining, you know. I can't imagine what some folks go through. I don't want to have to imagine. But how about these other things, the things people have done, the abuses in our lives? Those were not the enemy, even though some of them were pretty bad. Those were the shadow of the two trees right there, right in front of you. And your choice 
on how you respond. In some cases, things may have happened years ago, but I have chosen the response of the knowledge of good and evil. I've chosen the egoistic sense of gratification through judgment and condemnation. I've cho chosen all that. And I still live in the shadow of that tree in that area of my life. And many times because we won't let go of that tree in that area, you see the tree of knowledge of good and evil is good and it's evil. Because we won't let go of its evil, we have a different point of view of good many times than God does. And our delusion, if you want to call it that, because remember, those who say they see are the ones who are blind. Our delusion is that we're stand righteous before God because of my choices and my points of view. I may fall say, well, no, Jesus made me righteous, but we don't treat others that way. Do we? It's interesting. To close, I want to close with a verse. In the Amplified Bible, this particular segment was translated by a, a Greek scholar by the name of Kenneth Wiest. And I just really like the flow of this. He says, whoever finds his lower life will lose it the higher life. But whoever loses his lower life on my account will find it the higher life. Prior to this, he talks about taking up your cross. Where's the real warfare? You see, out here, out in the physical world, there's really no warfare going on out there. They're just shadows of the trees in the eternal world, the illusion that we think it is. Whatever we think it may be is what it is. physical world is only 1% of reality by virtually every Hebrew Jewish scholar I've ever read they'll tell you that and that probably goes off into other religious systems we'll probably say the same thing too but you never guess it by the way some of us live that this is the ultimate reality and we're hoping to get to a better place later on no this is a reality but it is not ultimate reality the thing is, you are already living in ultimate reality. You are already seated in heavenly places in Christ, not because you chose to, hear me out, it's because he lift, raised you up there in his resurrection. Does that make sense? So now it's not about me or them. It's about choice. I'm wondering whether or not I realize that's the world I truly live in or I'm still living in the matrix. Do I really want to see it. I'm going to challenge you. Do you really want to see this? Do you really want to see the resurrected Christ? Do you really want to see the answer that gnawing question that brought you to church or to listen to this live stream or to go to a Buddhist temple or to go to a synagogue? Or do you really want to answer that question? Because once you truly want that question, like Morpheus says in the movie, there's no turning back. When you really come to the odd dog on it, this is it. This is my day of decision. I want the answer. It may take a while for us to totally embrace and understand all of what the answer has, but when I've truly come to that place, there's no turning back. We do wind up going down the rabbit hole and see how far it goes. And we bounce along the walls of the rabbit hole as we descend. That's okay. But I hope today I can help you understand what your purpose in this life is. Your purpose is to choose your reaction. That's it. It's not about the size business you have. It's not about um, what ministry you have. It's not about even the person you marry. Those all become shadows. Say, well, no, I, I just noticed the newlyweds over here going, oh, shoot. <laughs> it's part of it but it's part of the shadow the ultimate purpose here because you're going to go on forever 
The purpose here is the choice every waking, sleeping moment of my response to the object. Our opponent is in our reaction, not in the object. Many times, however, because we think we see, we place something on the object that causes something of the flesh, if you will, or egoism to rise up. And I never really get free of that object. I drag it around with me. I dress it up, put on perfume, let it smell good even. I mean, let's face it, what's one of the purposes of perfume? To cover over body odor or to attract something. I'm not saying it's bad. I put on cologne before I came here. I'm not, you know, I'm not saying that you shouldn't. I know after I play drums, some of you want me to put on some cologne. <laughs> Whoever finds his lower life will lose it the higher life. But whoever loses his lower life on my account will find it the higher life. And it comes down to a choice. It's, it begins with that choice we make whenever it was some of us years ago, maybe just yesterday, maybe today. I recognize Christ. Didn't die for me. He died as me. He didn't re resurrect for me. He resurrected as me. And I'm going to get on his, I'm going to connect to that reality. But the second I do, all of a sudden the illusion of the tree of knowledge of good and evil has to leave. Because if not, I'm only going to take that and now make it back into right and wrong, good and evil, and egoistic pleasure. In every aspect. Livestream, I hope some of this made sense. Some of you maybe have never heard some of these Genesis Factor class. Some of these may, around Oasis may make sense because they hear me and some of the others here uh, a lot. Maybe if you're visiting today, you're like, what is he talking about? Uh-uh, that's the devil over there. That devil did that. I think the greatest, one of the greatest funny inventions of that was Flip Wilson back in the 70s. Do you remember that? The devil made me do it poking fun at all of us in our religiosity. I have a lot of respect for what I've now used to call the secular world as a religious man because a lot of them are pointing out our religious ignorance. You can learn from folks who think differently than you unless they just become the object and the enemy, the unbeliever, the devil. Praise the Lord. Live stream. We're going to pray. Um, you're not physically necessarily with us, but you're with us by virtue of video. And I want you to bow your head and pray with me too. And if these words ring in you in some way, I've tried to address that thorn, <laughs> as Morpheus puts it, in all of us. But we, we have to come to terms with the fact that the answer, even what I'm suggesting to you, you have to see it yourself. You have to see this entire system as the matrix or the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And that you don't have to live in it. But you can, if you will, rise above it in the person of what the Christ truly is. Let's pray. Father, source of all life, God, I thank you for what we call salvation. That it's not saving us from as much as it would is it unveils us as. Lord, thank you that this salvation unveils that we are and are designed to be just like you. That we are co-creators with you. 
that we can love you, you love us, and we can love one another. And that by loving my brother is loving God. Whether they know or don't know who they are. It's irrelevant. Father, I pray that some of us would want to brave this further and say, Lord, show me more of the system I'm not part of. Show me more of how I yield and react to that system. Maybe, Lord, some of us in the, quote, Christian church need to ask, Lord God, show me how I've used Christianity and actually the whole time I've been just as secular, just as judgmental, just as reactive as anybody else. Lord, help us realize that I can't change really anybody. I can only choose my reaction. And in my reaction, what I release in the atmosphere around me is really what can touch a life. In Jesus' name, may your image be continually unveiled in all of us. Amen.